Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alicia Rowland, and I am the Director of Christian Education for Children and Youth here at the church. And it is my honor and privilege to welcome you to, wor to worship this morning, whether in person or online, but also to invite you to pick up that little black book, better known as our friendship pad, and please take the time to sign in. Once you pass that little black book down, pass it back so that you can read the names of the people around you. So after worship, you can get to know each other better. Let us worship the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Sing glory to his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice.
Today's main passage from Scripture comes from the 18th chapter of the Gospel, according to Matthew, and offers us a clear reminder that God's hierarchy of importance is not the same as ours. In an effort to elevate himself above others, one of the disciples asked Jesus, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Having continually fallen short of the clear teaching of Jesus, let us confess our sins using the words printed in the bulletin. Most merciful God, we confess today that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. You tell us that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And yet we do everything within our earthly power to elevate ourselves above You command us to love our enemies, yet we hold grudges those who have wronged us and keep those who are different than us at arm's length. Retrain us in the ways of Jesus, Heavenly Father, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. to these beloved and cherished words from Psalm 103. For we know that everyone who approaches the throne of grace, asking for forgiveness, will be fully reconciled to God through Christ Jesus. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. With a new and childlike commitment to love others and to follow God without hesitation, please greet your neighbor saying, Peace be with you.
children come and join me on the steps this morning? I missed you last week, and I am very grateful for Miss Katie for stepping in and delivering such a beautiful message to you and to you. Today, when you head off to Sunday school, you guys are going to learn about a man named John the Baptist. Now, John had a very special job. His job was to help pave the way for Jesus. What do you think that means, to pave the way for someone else who's coming. Yeah. yeah, he was coming along and telling them. What were you going to say, Henry? Pave the right way, right? Like clear the path and make sure that everybody, as many people as he could interact with, he was telling them about a savior was coming. But he was also doing something else. He was telling them And when I say them, I mean everyone. He wasn't just talking to um, the people who were going to temple and doing the right things. He was talking to everyone. And he was saying, turn from your old ways and you can be forgiven and start anew. What do you think that means? Turn from your old ways. Yeah. Maybe all the bad things you can do, you start fresh. Perfect. See, and now I have to give a sermon after this. Okay, so, exactly. So, I love visual aids. I love to imagine what something might look like. So, can you all stand up for me? All right, we're going to face this way. So that idea of to turn from our old ways. So what's in front of us is the mistakes we've made. So John the Baptist and then later Jesus was coming and saying, turn from your old ways. So now let's turn and we're going to face this way. Leave that behind you and now let's take a couple steps forward. Without looking back, just step forward. It's a cool visual, isn't it? All right. You all can have a seat. That idea that God used John the Baptist to pave the way for Jesus' coming. So when people started hearing Jesus' message, they were ready. So I'm going to have you help me pave the way a little bit today. And I am going to ask you to use your full voice, or as Dr. Decker would say, forte, right, as your loud voices, that I'm going to say something and I want you to repeat it. A message, that's what John the Baptist did. He was not going around and being quiet. He was, had a full voice. So I'm going to say something and I want you to repeat it. Can you do that for me? All right. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. All right. I know you all can be louder than that. Let's try that one more time. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus forgives. Jesus forgives. Jesus cares. Jesus cares. Jesus is love. Jesus is love. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Thank you. Those words are reminders for us each and every day. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. And we thank you for John the Baptist for paving the way for Jesus to come. Lord, help us to look to you, to look to the children, to hear those pure and true meaning of your your message to us. That you love us, that you care for us, and that you are the true meaning of love. Be with us always. Amen. All right, have fun in Sunday school.
The Lord invites us to go to him in prayer. We accept his invitation. Let us pray. Dear Lord, our first prayer is one of thanksgiving. You have blessed us with your presence here in this sacred place. Blessed us with freedom to worship. Freedom to live in a democracy where we have a voice and freedom to make choices about what we do with our lives. You've blessed us with a wonderful interim pastor, staff, and volunteers who are leading us to come together as a congregation and grow. We give you abundant thanks for all these blessings and many more too numerous to count. Help us to listen to you and follow you so we can make the most of all the blessings you've given us. We pray that in all we say and do, we please you. We pray for the health, happiness, and well-being of our family, friends, and neighbors. We pray you will give your healing touch to Will Gaskins, Susan Manwaring, and J.B. Shelton. We pray for those of us and those dear to us who are struggling with big problems and big decisions. Please wrap your arms around them so they feel your love, your presence, and your strength. Give them your guidance and put people in their path to help them. We are worried about people who are struggling from recent tornadoes, floods, and monumental snowstorms. We pray they have people around them who are your arms and legs to help in such hard times. We pray for this world that so badly needs your love and the teachings of your son, Jesus. We live in a chaotic world of war, displacement, racism, poverty, homelessness, and division. We pray that you will put, we pray that you will put a yearning for peace on the hearts of people fighting wars. Help them find a way to peace. We pray that you will help each of us out of our comfort zones and out of comfortable Christianity that risks nothing. Help us to find our own way to contribute to making our corner of the world a better place. Give us courage to take the risks necessary to do that. In spite of everything wrong, there are many more things right in this world. Help us see and appreciate the good around us. Give us grateful hearts. Help us find you in unexpected people and places. Help us be good stewards of this natural world. It is a beautiful gift you've given us. Help us protect it and preserve it. Hear us now, God, as we pray silently to you our own special prayers. Dear Lord, in all things, help us to hear you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us pray. Loving God, you are the source of every good and perfect gift. We have so many reasons to say thank you to you. Your generosity, grace, and mercy are astounding. And we pray that the gifts we offer here in worship and throughout the week might be used to glorify your name, to build up your kingdom. Help us to be generous with our money, our time, and our talents. Strengthen us to recognize your blessings, to be grateful, and to respond accordingly. Good morning. When I was asked to talk about why I give for the stewardship campaign, I started thinking back to my youth, and I decided to talk more about my giving journey as from a young child to today. You know, I gave when I was young because my parents gave me the money to give. You know, they'd say, here, when you get in there, just put it in the plate. Don't take it out, Stephen. Put it in. I'm like, okay, I got it. But as I grew older, uh, I gave because I really started to feel a connection to the church, and to, especially my junior and senior high years when I became much more involved. In college, I gave because I saw the Lord and what He had done in the lives of so many college students that listened to Him. As I became a parent, I gave because I wanted the programming for my children that I had had as a youth, and I felt that was a way to be helpful and influential and have a say in what they were doing. And I'm so proud of what the churches, which we went to four Presbyterian churches in the time from when our children were born up through their uh, college years. And I really wanted to see them in church and versus what so many were doing, which was going to the mall, meeting up with their friends, playing the video games. And I wanted to see them to see how important it was to me and to my wife. And also, again, it would be to them. Now I give because I know the money that I've been giving is going to help others uh, really bring them to people to Christ and to support the missions for people that are less fortunate than me. I see the passion at the session meetings. I wish everyone had the opportunity to just listen when you hear people from the missions committee talk about why they want to give and what they want to give. You know, it just, you could tell it means so much to them. And, and in turn, it makes us feel great as a church and as an elder, in my case, to be giving. Also, I see the pastoral nominating committee and the commitment that they have and what they want to see in the growth going forward because we know as a church when our new pastor does come, that's one going to be because the Lord brought him or her here and most importantly that it's going to mean so much to the lives of so many. I want to ask how many people were here last Sunday for the church service? Can I see a show of hands? Great many of you. Wonderful. Uh, if you did, then you heard Pastor Pablo talk about the four things. I said to him at a call during the week, I so wish he had been back here just so I could kind of poke at him. Uh, so I could say, see, I did listen to you. Uh, because he said, you know, were you nodding your head? I said I was praying the whole time, Pastor, I promise. But he said four things that were important. Stop, look, listen, and follow. And I truly will be, as each one of us, if we're following Christ in his word, and in the example of Corinthians 9, 7, he tells us to give. He says, each person must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, but for God loves a cheerful giver. I'm excited about the future of Moorings Church for so many different reasons, for my opportunities as a, an elder, uh, be on the PNC committee looking with the next pastor, the men's Bible study, and I see the energy levels in the church continue to grow. And for my wife and I, it's a way of life, and it's something we're very proud of, and I'm sure for so many of you it is also. So I hope that as you look to the future of the church, one way you share, as Alicia said earlier, your time, your talents, and hopefully as you have the opportunity, your funds that will allow us to continue to grow. Thank you so much for your time this morning.
One more time, here we go. Maybe this is all right. Um, a little piece of history about me. I may stand there um, and do children's moments and work with the youth and teach classes, but it's been about 30 years since I stood here and gave a sermon. And I can guarantee I am just as nervous now as I was then. But just like I love to start my children's moments with questions, I have a question for you. The title of the sermon, Become Like a Child. Now, who in here, when they read or heard the phrase, become like a child, were like, ah, yes, no worries in the world, no bills to pay, no doctor visits, no dealing with traffic and hassles, wouldn't that be nice? Or were you thinking, no thank you, because becoming like a child means I have to be a teenager again, I have to start my career again, find a new relationship, and that was a lot of work. I'm good, no thank you. Well, when I read that title, it was on a commentary as I was preparing for today. I read it, I thought, yes, someone else gets it. Because I wholeheartedly believe that there is nothing better than the heart and mind of a child. They have so much to teach us. Hence, Jesus' passage. What does it mean to become like a child? Let me read the scripture for you again. Paula did a beautiful job of introducing it as part of our call to confession, and then we confessed that we keep falling short and not listening to what God is telling us to do. Let me read it for you from the book of Matthew, but it is also found in Mark and Luke, chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to them and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child welcomes me, welcomes my name, <laughs> child, and my name welcomes me. This is the word of the Lord. I love that visual imagery. Can you picture it? A group of men who have been traveling with Jesus, learning about all that he can do, his power, his healing, listening to his teachings, and there they are caught up again in how do I get to be the best? Now Jesus' response isn't, well, here's your checklist. It isn't, really, you're asking me this again? You haven't gotten this yet? Jesus goes over and takes the hand of a small child and brings the child and puts the child in the center of the great group and says, you must humble yourself to their lowly position. Now in Jesus's time, a child didn't have rights or any kind of status, and they certainly weren't used as a model for anything. Not that they weren't loved and seen as a gift from God, but as one commentator wrote, they were seen more as property, not as people. A child today really isn't that different than a child then. It's how we view them. When a child is born, they are born completely helpless. They depend on us for everything. It's our responsibility to raise them to believe that they can trust. As they grow, they have very little control over what they get to do. I mean, they try, right, to have control, but they don't. It is up to us to raise them, but to raise them in a way that they can continue to trust us. I think that illustration is what God is talking about with our faith, that we are supposed to trust God. We are supposed to depend on God. He promises us that he will be with us always. He tells us we should not be anxious or worry about anything, but give it to him and he will carry us. Children are humble and pure of heart. 
As a child is growing and learning, they are seeking love and understanding. As a parent and teacher, I have heard a lot of, but why? But why? But when? But how? Have you experienced that too with little ones? But they are seeking answers. They want to know. They want to grow closer. They want to feel that connection to you. Now, I try to be patient. I try to think of how do I communicate this to them so they will understand. But lots of times there's one more, but why, but how. So I come to the point where I'm just like, because I said so, right? As adults, I think we still get to that point with other adults, because I said so. But I think that is what God is saying too. He wants us to ask questions. He wants us to seek answers, but those questions are there to help us grow closer to him. And there comes a point where God is saying, because I say so, trust me. We have to choose to believe. Children are filled with hope and curiosity. Children are open to learning new things and see the world of endless possibilities. A child sees every child as a child of God until they are told differently. This December, we had the joy of going Christmas caroling, um, and we went to Maureen's Park and the Glenview, and when we were at Maureen's Park, we were, I asked the children to hand out candy canes to everybody who had come to listen to us sing, and the children were handing them out. They were so excited, and in my eyes, we were done. Everybody had their candy cane, and I had one little boy come up to me and say, Miss Alicia, I need some more candy canes. I'm thinking, for your pocket? But I didn't say anything. I gave him the candy canes, and I watched. And he went over and into the kitchen, and he made sure everyone in the kitchen staff also received their candy canes. Everyone meant everyone. To a child, everyone is a child of God until they are told differently. Become like little children. Humble, pure of heart, trusting, full of hope. Jesus used this as a visual to make a point. It was not an idea, but a concrete concept. So how do we become like a child? We can't turn back time and erase all the things that cause us to have fear, doubt, anger, disappointment. That's there, that's in our lives. But what we can do is turn to them so we can be reminded, so we can be inspired by them, so we can see what it means to live out God's call for us. As I was trying to figure out what passage I would use for today and what I would talk about, I did just that. I texted my youth group kids and I said, Will you share with me what it means to have faith? And then I texted a group of parents and I said, will you ask your kids and will you send that to me? Ask them what it means to have faith. Not surprising, their answers were very inspiring. We have an opportunity on Sunday mornings to hear what the young children have to say, but this is what they answered when asked, what does faith mean? Faith means believing in God, believing that God created all things, trusting God, loving one another, taking care of each other, and believing in God is what makes me a Christian. I also want to share with you some of the older youth's responses, and their responses, I bet you can relate because you can hear the honesty and the struggle with how faith, although we are supposed to think of it simply, it's not always the easiest thing to have. One student replies, to have faith is not only to believe in God, but to constantly be trying to become closer to God 
and to live for him. I don't think believing in him is enough, but trying to live for him by acting like Jesus did is having active faith. It's a good reminder of how we should be living our life. Another student writes, faith means recognizing we can't do life alone. There's that dependency, right? It's prioritizing showing gratitude to God through it all, leaning on him when things are hard, but not forgetting about him when things are good. More than anything, a strong faith is built on trust, that he is at work even when we can't see it. Another student, and I really appreciate um, these thoughts. Faith for me takes patience and is changing. Sometimes I feel like my, strong, my faith is not strong enough. And when it feels weak, I feel like I shouldn't even be acting in faith. But I have found that faith isn't something you can use up. And so when you take steps of faith, your faith will grow in unexpected ways. Acting with faith helps me to understand God better. Really good thoughts, right? And one more. When I think about having faith or putting trust in God, I think about free will that God gave to us. God could have designed us to love him no matter what, but what is love if it isn't voluntary and without sacrifice? God doesn't force us to come to him. He has offered us his entire kingdom by the blood of his son. But it is our choice to come to him and to receive that. And while it is scary to leave behind your old life, faith is taking the decisions we make and the life that we lead and giving it all to God. I could have just read their comments and I would have been fine for today because their words are inspirational. Jesus used this little child as an example to show the importance of humility. But the passage doesn't end there. It ends with verse 5. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So what does it mean to welcome? Welcome is more than just putting a child in the center of the group and talking about them. Welcoming means learning someone's name, caring for them, teaching them, sharing with them God's love, helping them to have a relationship with Christ. This message wasn't just for those disciples then. It was for a community of faith our community of faith, that we are to care for one another. And if we are going to prioritize raising our children and the church, we need to be an example. If we're going to teach them to love God with their whole heart, mind, and soul, we better be loving God with our whole heart, mind, and soul. If we are going to teach them to love your neighbor as yourself, you better believe they're going to be looking to us to see what does that look like. I invite and encourage you to get to know our children, to learn each other's names, because as a community of faith, when we build a relationship with each other and with Christ, all things are possible. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Lord, Help us to become like children, to trust you even when we do not understand, to seek a relationship with you, to have hope and believe that through you all things are possible. Help us to live by your example, to be a community that truly welcomes others the way we would welcome you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand if you are able and to join me in reading the Apostles' Creed as we claim our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. now there we go so today after church instead of having regular fellowship snacks um, chef Evie has prepared sandwiches and and um, veggies and chips so we can have a light lunch and stay for our state of the congregation meeting in which our leadership will share some updates about what is happening in the church parents your children are have been moved over to the gyms and they can stay there so you can attend the meeting. Today at four, we are welcoming the Borealis Wind Quartet as part of our Hyacinth series. And on January 28th is our annual congregational meeting in which we will be um, voting on some of our changes of our bylaws. Thank you for today. 
Thank you for having open hearts and open minds every Sunday to hear what the children have to say. Let us continue to be inspired by them. Until we meet again, may the, the peace of Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us always.